Well, many of you know by now that a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Jeff and I, along with our wives, were able to take what really was the trip of a lifetime to Israel. How many of you have had a chance to be to, at the, in the Holy Land personally? A few of you, so you kind of understand what that experience is like. But even if you haven't been to the Holy Land, I think you might be able to imagine what a thrill it was for us to be there. Uh, to see the ruins of Peter's house in Capernaum. Uh, this is looking down through a, a plate of glass to an archaeological site that they believe was the home of Peter and where Jesus would have slept from time to time when he was there. Or to wade into the Sea of Galilee. Uh, someone saw this picture and said, Pastor Brian, I didn't know you had a daughter. Uh, I thought, very funny. <laughs> to stand next to the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized uh, by John the Baptist. To sit on the southern steps of the great Temple Mount in Jerusalem where the early church took shape. We actually saw that in the book of Acts, chapter 2, earlier this year. Or to walk on a street where Jesus would have walked. In this particular street, he walked on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane the night he was betrayed. Or to see the church called the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the traditional site of both the crucifixion and the resurrection. A giant church covers both of those sites now. And much, much more. It would take me hours, maybe days, to, to sort of fill you in on all that we were able to see and learn. But beyond all of that, Beyond all the slideshows and the photos, what struck me as much as anything, I think, was noticing the other groups of people who were there doing what we were doing. For example, standing on top of a hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee, we heard a group of Korean believers begin to sing. In Korean, a song that we recognized. Or a group of Nigerian Christians uh, in Capernaum, standing under a huge, uh, a, a few fig trees, just singing and dancing in praise to their Lord. Five men from Texas who went down into the pit where Jesus was interrogated by Caiaphas on the night he was betrayed. And they sang a hymn from that pit. And we could hear them standing waiting our turn to visit. And then the church of St. Anne, uh, built on what is believed to be the birthplace of Mary, the mother of Jesus, our little group of 36 people or so, spontaneously began to sing the hymn, How Great Thou Art, echoing in this beautiful little cathedral. And as we got to the chorus, Then Sings My Soul, a group that was, I think, from France, standing across the way, began to chime in and sing with us on that chorus in French. And that's not to mention groups from Latin America that we saw, groups from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from India, from Southeast Asia. An amazing experience. Why are people from all over the world still traveling to Israel 2,000 years after a man named Jesus walked on this earth? Now, part of the answer we've already covered in the book of Acts in this series. Jesus said, Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses. He wanted the gospel to go out all over the world, and it has. But most of the answer has to do with what we talk about today. We're in the second part of a little mini-series here at Easter time uh, called The Reach of the Cross. And last week, we saw that the cross reaches out with forgiveness to those who mock and with hope for those who are broken. And today, we see the cross reaches up. Three words. He is risen. We're going to look today at the story Luke tells in Luke chapter 24. So if you could open your Bibles or look on the screens, I'm just reading eight verses out of Luke's gospel. Luke writes, on the first day of the week, now this would have been Sunday as I mentioned moments ago, uh, the first work day of the week in that culture at that time because the Sabbath was Saturday when they took time to worship. Uh, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now, their intent, as you may know, was to finish preparing the body of Jesus for a proper Jewish burial. They hadn't had time on Friday because Sabbath was getting ready to start at sundown, so they had to quickly entomb him and plan to come back later and anoint his body. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, 
and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. I'm going to pause there. The first thing we need to talk about today is the cross leads to the resurrection. The cross leads to the resurrection. Seems like uh, a simple, straightforward statement, but let me explain. Uh, Have any of you seen those ads in the last year or so popping up for this website called Ancestry.com? You seen those? Has anybody tried that, gone back into your way back, had the courage to find out where you came from? Has anybody done that? Well, I haven't done it because I really haven't had to because for as long as I can remember, I knew plenty about my ancestors because my mother would tell stories and still tell stories of how she was born and raised in the hills of eastern Kentucky, uh, very, the region today we would call Appalachia, basically. Her father, my grandfather, was a man named Noah Sloan. We called him Pop. Uh, Now, Pop never went beyond eighth grade in school, yet became a a relatively successful businessman running several businesses during his lifetime. And my grandmother, who we called Mom Mom, had her first baby at age 15, which was a fact they tried to hide for a long, long time in the family. Pop had brothers named Harlan, Dan, Wiley, Lark, and Plez. And he had two sisters named Arizona and Derona. The sister named Arizona married a man named Canada, so her name was Arizona Canada. I'm not making this up. It's all true stuff. They were mountain people. And my mother's kind of proud of that to this day. But mountain people, moonshine, feuds, shotguns, the whole works. I tell my boys, you're one generation removed from the Hatfields and McCoys. To cap it all off, one of my distant relatives, a man named Clifton Branham, Uh, Something like my great-great-uncle, once or twice removed, something like that, uh, uh, was well known. His claim to fame was that he was the last man hanged in Virginia. His sad story is told in a little book called Crimes, Criminals, and Characters of the Cumberlands in Southwest Virginia. My cousin sent this to me years ago, and I kept it. Uh, As the story goes, he um, shot his wife in a domestic quarrel. Uh, and uh, was arrested and sentenced to be hanged uh, on September 25th, 1903. And as the story goes, he did two things before he went to the gallows, and it's written right in this little book. First, he asked for his guitar so he could sing a hymn, which he did. Then he asked his family to promise that after his execution, they would open his coffin because he was going to rise from the dead. That's what he did. And so after the hanging, sorry, it's kind of graphic, the relatives took him by horse-drawn cart back through the mountains to his burial place, and they stopped to honor their promise to Uncle Clifton. When they opened up the coffin, it's written there that they noticed unusually large drops of sweat on his forehead, but he was cold in death. And I kind of chuckled at that. Maybe he was really trying hard. I, I don't know how to take that. But there are two sides to the claim of resurrection. First, Jesus had to be really dead. Now, that sounds like an, a no-brainer. That sounds like Captain Obvious. You know, he had to be really dead. But throughout history, there have been plenty of people who have claimed that Jesus didn't really die, but rather just passed out on the cross and was mistaken for dead. That's called the swoon theory. Actually been around for centuries, was made popular again in the 1970s by a book entitled The Passover Plot. In, any, in, any, uh, in other words, Jesus was only mostly dead. Any Princess Bride fans here? <laughs> Big difference between mostly dead and all the way dead, right? Now, to believe the swoon theory, you would have to believe that Jesus survived a beating survived the Roman scourging, which sometimes killed men by itself, carried his crossbar called the patibulum for almost a half a mile, collapsing three times along the way, had iron spikes driven through his hands and his feet, endured six hours hanging, nailed to the cross, suffered blood loss and dehydration, had a spear thrust up into his side, piercing both his lungs and his heart, was placed in a cold stone tomb without food or water for 36 hours, and got better. Got so much better, in fact, that he had the strength to single-handedly roll away a two-ton stone, overpower a squadron of trained, armed Roman guards, and disappear forever into history. 
It's much easier to believe, I think, that the Romans were just really good at killing people. And they were. The brutal Roman Empire crucified tens of thousands of Jews in the first century. And they knew how to get that job done. Historians tell us that the Romans actually experimented with crucifixion. They experimented with different shapes, crosses. They experimented with different processes to see how long they could keep someone alive and still put them to death. They experimented to see what could they do to speed up the process if they needed to speed it up. And we see that in Jesus' story because we are told that they came along because Sabbath was getting ready to start and they had a deal with the Jewish leadership not to leave men up on the crosses during Sabbath. And so they needed to get them good and dead. So they broke the legs of the two thieves, the two criminals uh, next to Jesus to speed up the process. But with Jesus, they didn't need to because they knew he was already dead. The spear thrust up into his side produced blood and water or clear substance indicating that his lungs had collapsed and he had already died from asphyxiation. Pilate demanded that the death be confirmed, likely by four separate witnesses, before he would allow the body to be taken for burial because he had to be sure, because his neck was on the line with his superiors in Rome. And this is why the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died. That Christ died for our sins in according with the Scriptures. In other words, the first thing you need to understand is that he really died. He was flesh and blood. The Word become flesh, a human being, and he died a real death. So before we can talk about resurrection, we have to talk about the cross and the tomb. Jesus died, was really buried. Secondly, for any of this to mean anything at all, uh, Jesus had to go from being really dead to really alive. There has to be a resurrection. Luke says, the men said to them, the angels, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Now, my guess is that most of you are here today because, to some degree or another, you believe that's true, that Christ is indeed risen. But the truth is, much of the world does not believe that to be true in any way that's verifiable. Most of the neighbors that you have, most of the people you work with, maybe even most of your extended family, don't really take the resurrection all that seriously. Fine for you if you want to believe that sort of biblical fairy tale. That's the attitude. But let's back up for a moment. Virtually no one, even the greatest skeptics of our time, disputes that Jesus actually lived, that he was a historical person, and that he was executed in about 33 AD under the order of Pontius Pilate of Rome. For example, we know from archaeology and extra-biblical sources that Herod and Caiaphas and Pilate were real historical figures right at that time. There's no dispute about that. Newsweek magazine just came out with a 100-page special edition called Jesus, His Life After Death. And these 100 pages do not dispute the facts of Jesus' earthly life. Everyone agrees Jesus lived. The dispute arises when we come to the claim of resurrection. And there are two things I really want you to hear today. First, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is the pivotal event in all of human history. The pivotal event. It's the reason we divide all of history into B.C. and A.D., or in the more politically correct terms, B.C.E. and C.E. More than that, the eternal destiny of every human soul hinges, depends on who Jesus is and what he has done. Just as Uncle Clifton actually fulfilling his promise to raise from the dead would certainly change how I think of him, so the claim of resurrection must change how we think about Jesus. Secondly, and this might sound wildly overconfident depending on your perspective, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is also one of the most historically verifiable facts of human history. Let me explain why. First, his body was never 
recovered. His body was never produced. This sounds overly simple, but let's think about it for a moment. His ministry was public. There's a mountain of evidence that says by the time he died, he was one of the most famous men in all of Jerusalem, if not the entire country of Israel. His death was very public on purpose. The Romans held their crucifixions near major roads, major gates into and out of cities so that they would achieve maximum visibility because the purpose of crucifixion was to intimidate whole people groups. Look and see what happens if you defy the power of Rome. And we know the tomb in which he was placed had to be very near the execution site uh, because of the time frame. And Jerusalem was not a big place in the first century, inhabited by about 80,000 people, roughly the size of the Tri-Cities. There just weren't that many places where they could have put him. It wasn't a secret. We know that the leaders of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, were afraid, very afraid, that Jesus' disciples might try to steal the body. In Matthew 27, we read this. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go. Go. Make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone, that's the Roman seal, and posting the guard. We know that Pilate's greatest fear was allowing some sort of disturbance that would attract the attention of his superiors in Rome because he had already been in trouble several times. So there were a great many powerful people who had a great interest in making sure Jesus of Nazareth was dead and gone. As Newsweek puts it, they needed Jesus and his message to stay dead. And all they had to do was produce a corpse. They knew where he was buried. They had a Roman guard posted around the clock. Not that hard. Or was it? The second theory I'd mentioned tonight, and there are several I could, but I'm mentioning one more, is called the stolen body theory. Some have said throughout history that, well, his, father, his followers just somehow managed to, to steal his body from the tomb, put it in a secret grave, then manufactured the story of the resurrection to keep the movement of Jesus going. In fact, the New Testament tells us this is actually the story the religious leaders, Jesus' enemies, tried to spin following his death. In Matthew 28, we read, when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, this is now following the claim of resurrection when the tomb was empty, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. By the way, sleeping on your duty was punishable by death in the Roman army. If this report gets to the governor, who was Pilate, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated to this very day. The stolen body theory makes a little bit of sense until you think a little more deeply about it. It would mean the disciples, Jewish men, would have been willing to violate very strict Jewish religious laws about touching a dead body. Then they had to find a way to overwhelm or bribe a group of trained Roman guards and then uh, take the body away without anybody noticing, and then hide it forever. And then after all that, start up a new faith based on the claim of resurrection, a claim that would get almost all of them killed, martyred within just a few years. That's what you have to believe. Let me try to set up a scenario for you just for fun. Let's say you love Pastor Jeff. Let's say you think he's just the greatest, most awesome pastor in the world, and I I think he's pretty neat too, okay? Okay. Uh, Let's say a law is passed making it illegal, capital offense, to quote C.S. Lewis in public. (laughs) Work with me here a little bit. The punishment is death by watching Oprah reruns, okay? That's the punishment. (laughs) Jeff can't help himself. He quotes C.S. Lewis. He gets arrested, done away with, and is buried somewhere. You're beside yourself with shock and grief. You really miss him. And I do too. Now i got to go for a former search committee and all that sort of stuff. But someone comes up with a great idea. They say, let's just pretend Pastor Jeff's still alive. And we'll start a new religion called the Jeff Frazier cult. So secretly, a few of you dig him up, you cart him off, and you bury him in your backyard. Then you tell the world that he rose from the dead, and you start the Jeff Frazier cult. You sing songs about him. You tell stories about him. You quote C.S. Lewis like him. 
Then a few weeks go by and your boss calls you in at work and says, say, you're part of that new cult religion, right? You say, yes, I am. He says, you believe that Jeff Frazier guy's alive? You go, yes, I do. He goes, you're fired. That's crazy. A couple days later, your kids are kicked out of school. Then you yourself are arrested, thrown in jail, and they're going to torture you to death again with Oprah reruns until you recant your story. At what point along the way would you say, oh, oh, that Jeff Frazier, he's in my backyard, come, I'll show you where he is. Right? If anyone, from the powers that be to an accidental tourist, had been able to find and display the dead body of Jesus of Nazareth, they would have done it. And that movement that we now call Christianity would not have lasted a single day, let alone 2,000 years. Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians 15, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. We're wasting our time, in other words. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The cross leads to the resurrection. Secondly, in the story we see the cross gives access to God. Access to God. One of the more moving things we saw in Jerusalem was the western wall of the Temple Mount, which is also called the Wailing Wall. And it's called the Wailing Wall because day and night people come there to pray. They, many bring little tiny small pieces of paper with prayers on rolled up, and they stuff them into the small cracks and crevices in those ancient stones. And others press their faces up against the stone, and they weep, and they weep, and they weep, sometimes for hours at a time. And they do so because this part of the wall of the Temple Mount contains the most original stones from the first century construction of the temple. And it's the part of the wall closest to where the Holy of Holies would have been before it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. So people come from all over the world to pray at this spot because they believe that the divine presence, what the Old Testament calls the Shekinah glory of God, It dwells now in the stones. Where once it was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, it was the pillar that went before them by day and by night. Now they believe there's remnants of the presence in the stones. So the wailing wall represents access to God. But we are told something in the New Testament, something that happened at the moment of Jesus' death that changes everything. Matthew 27, verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now the curtain being talked about here is a huge veil, some 60 feet high and four inches thick, that hung between the Holy of Holies, where only one person could go once a year, the high priest, to, uh, on behalf of the sins of the people, and that separated that area from the rest of the world, from the rest of the temple, from the rest of the people. No one could go in there. But at Jesus' death, the veil is torn in two. Let me t- try to explain what that means. When I was about 10 years old, our family lived in a wing of the church where my father was pastor. His office separated our living quarters from the sanctuary. And the rule was, for us boys, you can't go into dad's office if the door's shut because that was his workplace. It was like his, his holy of holies. So one day, my brother and I are running around the house playing, and one thing leads to another, and I burst into his office thinking he wasn't in there, only realized he was. I, I burst through the closed door. He's in there in a counseling appointment with somebody from the church. And I thought, uh-oh. Before I could back out, he motioned to me. So I walked around to his side of the desk, sort of expecting the worst, and he turned me around. He said, this is my oldest son, Brian. And he turned me back and he said, what do you need from me? I was like, he didn't, he didn't scold me. He didn't really even seem angry. He was just my dad. And I realized I had access. I had a special kind of access. The torn veil means that through the cross we have access to God. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. We don't have to travel halfway around the world to pray to a bunch of stones We can be in the presence of God right here and right now because the temple veil was split. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2, For through him, Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. 
So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, listen, being the very cornerstone. The cross, by the cross, we have access to God. And thirdly, we see that the cross then leads to life. The cross leads to life. Many years ago when our boys were very little, I was putting a couple of them to bed in one of, our, one of the bedrooms and just about done when a brother from another bedroom came into that bedroom. And I was a little irritated because he was already supposed to be in bed in his room. And I said, uh, you're, buddy, you're supposed to be in bed. And he said to me, made a mess, daddy, made a mess. I said, well, go, go back to bed. I'll be there in a minute. But right as he got to the doorway, something, I, I got curious. I said, uh, what kind of mess? And he turned around, his eyes got really big, and he went, with the fish. And that got my attention. So I ran into the room, discovered he had tried to feed the one little fish we have, a little angel fish creatively named Angel, and then one little, one little tank. And he got his mind to try to feed it. He dumped, and he had accidentally dumped the entire canister of fish food into this little bowl of water. It was like a two-inch thick sludge of fish food on top of this tank. And I looked underneath, there's this little fish just gobbling up food as fast as it could. Yes, oh yes, oh yes. It's just eating like crazy. And I'm not a marine biologist, but I knew that that probably wasn't good. And the next day, sadly, angel the angel, angelfish expired, and we had to conduct a bathroom burial at sea, if you know what I mean. Well, it occurred to me later that we had just together encountered the two fundamental problems of human existence. My son had made a mess that he couldn't clean up by himself. The other one is, one day there's a fish in the tank on the dresser, the next day, gone. Life is fragile and short. The first problem is sometimes we make a mess, and sometimes the mess just happens to us. We can't clean it up all by ourselves. The second problem has to do with our mor mortality. We're here one day, and tomorrow we're gone. And both problems are addressed by the cross. Because Jesus died, our sins can be forgiven, our mess can be cleaned up. And because he rose again, even death is not the final word. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This living hope is new life then, that's eternal life with Christ when we die, and that's important. Many of you know this has been um, a difficult year in some ways at FBCG. It's been a year of losses, starting with the loss of staff members back last fall, Kim McCart and Pastor Roger. Since January, and you probably don't even know this, we've had at least eight funerals, memorial services, since January, just this year. I don't remember a time when we had so many of those. But at each one, while we have grieved those losses, we have been able to celebrate and stand on this promise, this living hope. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. New life then. It's a promise. But it also means new life now. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Not talking about heaven now. He's talking about life here, life now. A life of greater depth, a life of greater richness, a life of greater love, a life of greater joy is possible now. See, Jesus didn't come primarily to begin a program of moral education, although he was a great teacher. Jesus didn't come to establish a political action group although he did preach justice and mercy. He didn't come to heal all physical diseases, although he healed many and still does. He came for this, death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. He came so that spiritually dead people could live again. By his death, we can know our sins are forgiven, our failures are forgotten, our messes can be cleaned up, and by his resurrection, we no longer fear the end of this life. We no longer fear what lies beyond death. Our hope can be certain because not even death is the final word. 
And that hope, that living hope, rushes back into our lives today to produce peace and joy. All because of those three words. At the center of the story, he is risen. If you wanted to, you could go down south into Kentucky, head toward Virginia, find a small country cemetery in Osborne's Gap, Virginia. And if you looked long enough, you'd find the 112-year-old grave of Clifton Branham, my great, great, great uncle, whoever it was, the last man hanged in Virginia, who claimed that he would rise from the dead. But you would find that he's still there. But just outside the ancient wall of Jerusalem, there is a tomb carved out of rock, a tomb where they laid the lifeless body of Jesus of Nazareth. And if you were to go there today, and if you could find your way to that tomb with certainty, he would not be there. He would not be there because he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, just three words stand at the center of this story. Just three words that change everything. They change how we think about you. They change how we think about ourselves. They change how we think about our eternal destiny. They change everything. And so may the life that burst forth from that tomb 2,000 years ago, may the life that's burned in the hearts of your followers through 20 centuries, may that life Fill each believing heart here today with forgiveness, with hope, and with great joy. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.